We're in Revelation. We're at the end of chapter 12. We should get into chapter 13 a little bit today. Um, just as a quick review, chapter 12, we saw, we're starting to see some different symbolic things. Um, with a lot of literalism still there. You can take the, the events that uh, go around these symbols very literally, but we saw uh, a woman uh, appearing as a sign in heaven, a woman uh, clothed with the sun, the moon, uh, the moon under her feet, and her head a garland of 12 stars. Uh, we saw a great dragon. We saw the woman give birth to a child and the dragon waiting to destroy the child. And so to, to, we looked in the identity of these, of these symbols, these stars. Uh, the woman... The woman representing Israel, we know at this time, the seven-year period of tribulation time that we've been learning about lately, uh, is all focused on Israel. The church is gone. The church has been raptured. Uh, after ver or chapter 3, there's no more mention of the church here on earth. We'll see mention of the saints. It's different. It's not us. We're gone. God has told the church He has not reserved us for His wrath. And there's all kinds of verses, and we went through those uh, back then uh, in Thessalonians and that, and 1 Corinthians that talk about being changed in the twinkling of eye, being caught up together with those who've gone before, that there'll be a resurrection at that time. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with Him and meet Him in the air. That is not the second coming of Christ to the earth. Now, there are those who don't agree with that, and that's okay. They believe that some believe we'll be raptured in the middle of the tribulation. Some believe that we'll be raptured at the end and turn around and come right back. Uh, and their, their purpose for believing that usually is just that they figure that the church is uh, so corrupt that it needs to go through the judgment of God also. The problem is they also usually replace Israel. Uh, and, and they also usually have the mindset that... Uh, Israel has foregone all of its blessings that the Lord has promised it and that the church has replaced Israel. And so they set the church in the place. And we've talked a little bit about that coming through and, and why I don't believe that that's true. The 144,000 witnesses are the greatest witness of all of that because they are specifically listed. Uh, the 12 tribes of Israel are specifically listed there. So this has to be focused on Israel. And the church is gone, out of the way. As a matter of fact, you read in Second Thessalonians, I think it is that this, the, the Antichrist, the, the one we'll be talking about this afternoon or this morning, can't even be revealed until the church is taken out of the way. So for those of us in the church to try to figure out who this man is, kind of a waste of time. Because you're not really going to know. And why are we worried about it? We're not going to be here. So don't be focused on his identity. Focus on the one who is your identity, and that's Jesus Christ. That is the mission of the church. That is the commission of the church. That is who we are to focus on. And we do that, we won't stray from His Word. We won't stray from His, his guidance in our life and, and His mission, the things that He's given us to do while we are still here. So this woman with the 12 stars representing the 12 tribes of Israel, this is representative of Israel itself, says it gave birth to a child, and that this child then was taken up to God. We know that Messiah came through Israel. We know that Jesus came through the Jewish nation, that he came uh, through Mary. Some try to identify the woman as Mary herself, but when you get down to verse 6, it says, Then the woman fled into the wilderness. That would mean that Mary would still have to be here at the time of tribulation. So Israel as a nation is going to flee into the wilderness because of the dragon, because of the beast. Uh, we see in verse 4, uh, and some other verses here that, that give us the, the identity of the dragon himself. And that, it's Satan. Uh, verse 4 says his tail, or I'm sorry, where am I at here? Let's read verse 3. We'll start with verse 3. It says, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. Uh, his tail drew a third of the stars from heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. So we're getting a, a history here of even Satan in his existence. When he was uh, gone from being Lucifer, the, the cherub that covereth, he, he was described as, 
the, the one who is in charge of worship in heaven, uh, serving before the throne of God, and it says that iniquity was found in him, pride was found in him. Uh, we read in Isaiah his five I will statements. I will ascend to the, being the, the culmination of all of it. I, I will be like the Most High. He wanted to take God's place. And then if you look in Ezekiel chapter 14, you see God's answer to that. Um, in his five, basically, you won't. It's his five I will statements. His, his answers to Satan's I will statements. Uh, and then we see here that he was not completely cast out of heaven, we know. That he still has a place there. Not because he's righteous. Not because he intends to serve God. It's kind of like keeping your enemies close to you. It, it shows us that even still right now, as much as we give him credit, and as much as even though the word of God says that he is the, the prince of the power of the air, that he is the, the king of this world system, he still has to answer to God. And, and I know some of you guys are going to think I'm just beating this to death, but we have to, have to, have to remember, he is not the equal opposite of God. He still answers to God. Uh, we'll, we'll see here in a few minutes that he stands before the throne of God, accusing the brethren all day and night. So he is still there. But we're also going to see that he is at one point, God is done. And he is cast out of heaven, heaven and thrown to the earth. And we, we actually covered that last week, but we'll read it here again real quick. So he waited to try to devour the, the Messiah, this child, when he was going to be born. And all through the Jewish history, all through the history of Israel, we see all the opportunities that he took to try to annihilate Israel as a nation because of that promise. Uh, he has been at war since the Garden of Eden trying to prevent the promise from coming. And even when you look in Matthew chapter 4 and in Luke, the account of the temptation of Christ when he's taken out into the wilderness, fasted for 40 days, and then Satan shows up at what would be his weakest point physically. Uh, as a man, Satan shows up to tempt him. And how does Jesus answer him every time there's a temptation? It is written. Jesus holds fast. He doesn't, he doesn't fall to the temptation. He doesn't give in to any of the temptings of Satan. And establishes himself as the Son of God. As a matter of fact, when you read that, and it's, sometimes the Bible translated is, uh, if you are the Son of God, but in the original language, it's literally, since you are the Son of God. If you go back and read the, the Matthew chapter 4, since you are the Son of God, um, turn these stones into bread. So Satan knows who he is. He, he, he's not just saying, if you are, if you think you are. Satan knows exactly who he was talking to. Uh, so all through Jewish history, uh, we see that, that Satan has tried all kinds of things to try to prevent this and try to wipe out this nation. And even in uh, current history, and even still today, don't we see the whole world is staged against Israel today? Uh, if, if Satan could possibly wipe out this people and, and bring any of God's promises to be void, if he could prevent one single promise, he'd have, he'd have victory. But God has proven himself over and over again that he's the one really, truly in control. So don't let it disturb you too much that Satan still really has a place in heaven because he is answering to God as we see in the book of Job. But also he's standing there and he's accusing you day and night. He's accusing all of us of not being who we really are. Of not truly being redeemed. He can look and say, did you see what Glenn did? Did you see what this guy did over here? You see how he blew it today? You really want to call him yours? But the Bible also tells us that we have an advocate standing between us and Satan. Testifying that we do belong to Jesus and we'll see by the power of his blood and the word of his testimony. That he stands and he says, no, dad, he's mine. Remember the price I paid for him. He's accepted that. He's accepted our grace. He's one of us. He is in us. And it doesn't matter what Satan says against us. Even if it's true. Even if I do blow it today and he has some kind of accusation to take before God, Jesus is still standing there saying, no, I've forgiven his sin. He's accepted my gift. He's accepting the pardon. 
Isn't that amazing? It's not depending on you, even after you become saved, to continue to walk right and do everything right. When you fail, when you blow it, you still are not separated from the love of God. Read Romans chapter 8. Nothing, and it goes on through a whole list, including angels and demons. Nothing can separate. No other created thing, he ends that list with, can separate us from the love of God. Once you're found in him, you're in him. Verse 6 says, The woman fled into the wilderness and where, or where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her uh, there 1,260 days, so three and a half years, that Israel will be in the wilderness. When he comes to attack, when Antichrist has been finally raised up, when he breaks his deal, he's going to make a deal, the seven-year deal, which is going to begin the seven-year period of judgment of God on the earth. When he breaks that deal and he puts an end to sacrifice, and we see the three, or the three witnesses, the two witnesses uh, killed finally after three and a half years and not being able to touch them. But at one point, they're, they're killed. The, the Antichrist is able to kill them, slay them. They leave their bodies in the, in the middle of the street for three and a half days. At some point during that time, uh, Antichrist will go in and defile the temple with, a, with his own presence in the temple, saying that I am God, exalting himself above all that is called God. And then we see the witnesses are resurrected. That even though for a second, and it, it's like a second, I mean it's three and a half days, but for just for one moment, he's allowed to put to death finally, to overcome these two witnesses. The two mouthpieces of God who have been bringing more judgment or at least playing a role in the judgments that have been poured out in the seals and the, the trumpet judgments. These two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, he's finally able to overcome them. But then he still doesn't even control that. God raises them up, says the breath of life comes back into them. And everybody sees them and everybody fears. And another great earthquake and 7,000 people die. And yet, it says all those who are left, and I believe that because they are in Israel, even though all the rest of the world will see this, that it are those who are left in Israel yet to be, uh, to be saved, to give their, their lives to the Lord, says that they give glory to God. It's the only time that we see that. Outside of those individuals who will give their hearts to the Lord during that time in the 144,000, there's not a general statement sweeping the entire nation or anybody else except for that one spot the rest of the time when it talks about the world speaking about god it's blasphemy it's speaking against the god of heaven the rest of the time so i believe that that last bit i mean surely it could be other saints that come to faith during that time or because of that event but those who are left in jerusalem or those who are left in israel who see this firsthand that are standing there they're the ones that are going to have the fear of God put in them. They're the ones who are going to give glory to God. Because the Jewish nation, who will see this in Passover, is still looking for Elijah to come back. At the Passover table, we'll set a spot for Elijah. At one point during the Passover, we'll send one of the kids to the door to look and see if he's there. That's what the Jews do. And we're going to go through some of the steps and some of the things that they do. You know, We'll, we'll look at some of that stuff. We'll act out some things. Verse 7. It says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was there any place found for them in heaven any longer. So we looked at Michael and who he is. He's a, the, the archangel. As far as we know, there's only one archangel, and it's Michael. And he stands guard over Israel. And we looked at some of his other appearances throughout the Bible to... Uh, Showing up to fight so that Gabriel could break through from the prince of Persia and get the message to Daniel. We see that his, he has other interaction with Satan because it says in Jude that Michael and Satan disputed over the body of Moses. That God had claimed for that body that he had another use, which is why we think that the other witness is, uh, is uh, Moses and not just Elijah, but the second witness would also be Moses. And that Michael himself, this great archangel... Didn't even go really to war with him. And it really wasn't much more of a war of, war of words even. Because it says Michael didn't bring any accusation against Satan. He didn't try to talk him down. He didn't 
telling him how bad and nasty he was. He already knows all that. He didn't get in his face like we see some men try to think that they would do if they truly saw Satan in front of them. All Michael did was say, the Lord rebuke you. And that's the end. That's it. That's the end of discussion. Satan does nothing more than that. And Michael didn't have to do any more than that. But we do see that war will break out in heaven. And the angels will go to war with one another until Satan and the others, are, the fallen angels, are thrown out. And it says in verse 9, so the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan. So it wasn't real hard for us to identify who the dragon was, was it? Who deceives the whole world and is cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. It says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accuses them before God, before our God, day and night has been cast down. God will be finished. He'll be done. Uh, he'll going to look at Satan and say, I will hear no more from you. You're out of here. It says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to death. And that's the true mark of a believer, isn't it? We do not love our lives even to death. We, a couple Thursday nights ago when I taught, we taught on the Beatitudes in Matthew. And that, how it shows the maturity of a believer. And it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But at the end of it, that last on the list, blessed are those who are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And it describes the persecution of a believer. And it basically, it, it says when you've reached that point, that, that's the ultimate maturity of a believer. When we can say, my life doesn't matter. I'm not out here to preserve myself. God has preserved me. My days are numbered. My days are in His hand. And it won't go beyond that. But the enemy also will not take me out even a day, not even a moment before that. There's a time appointed for every man to die. And I think that goes right down to the very second God is in control of your life. But look how we overcome. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their, of their testimony. This is how we overcome. It's not because we know how to speak. It's not because we know how to sing. It's not even the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us that help us to overcome. It's the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. If you don't have the blood of Jesus, it doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter what you do inside the walls of the church. It doesn't matter who you associate yourself with on the face of this earth. You don't overcome unless you have the blood of the Lamb on you. You will not escape the second death without the blood of the Lamb. Just as in Passover, they would not have escaped the death, the plague of death that came through Egypt if they did not have the blood of that innocent Lamb spread on their doorposts to their homes. If they did not sacrifice the, that Lamb the same way, in the, in the way that God had told them to do. And in that way, every bit of that sacrificial lamb speaks of Jesus. It's all a prophecy, a picture prophecy of Jesus and how He would come and what kind of a, a sacrifice He would be. Right down to don't break any of its bones. And we know that while He hung on the cross, as they went to break the bones of the thieves and to break the bones of Jesus, they did not break His bones. But that's how we overcome. Verse 12 says, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. And woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. So if you're in heaven, this is to you. Rejoice to you. The accuser's gone. Woe to you who are left on the earth. It says, For the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And whatever you think the enemy has poured out in your life now, well, however strong you think he's been, and however much you think he's been able to prevail against you, he doesn't even have a fraction probably of the, of the anger he will have when he is finally put out and no longer allowed to accuse you. But he is confined to earth for the final judgments. So now we get to where we left off. Verse 13 says, Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, 
He persecuted the woman and gave birth, uh, who gave birth to the male child. I guess we did cover all this, didn't we? Gave birth to the male child, but the woman was given two wings of, great, of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is uh, nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So there's a place in the wilderness that Israel will be able to flee to when, when we see all this happen, we see this event with the, with, the, uh, um, with the two witnesses, their death and their resurrection. We see the uh, Antichrist go in and defile the temple and put an end to sacrifices and exalt himself above all that is called God. The Bible tells Israel to flee. Jesus told them to flee. He said, pray that it's not in the wintertime. Pray that you're not pregnant or nursing. When that time comes, don't go get your coat. Don't go pack a bag. Don't do anything. Go. Flee to the wilderness. And we know here that there's a place prepared for them. And if you go to the wilderness area in Israel, if you go to a place called Petra, that's where we think the place is of their protection. It's a, it, impossible for an army to come in to attack. It's built into the walls of the cliffs. It can house all kinds of people. I don't even know how many people it could possibly house. But it appears that that's the place to go. It's my understanding that if you go back there, and I think it's on horseback if you go in, or however they take you back in there, but you pretty much are going in single file. That's how narrow the passage is, is to get back in there. And that's probably the place. Now, the Bible doesn't say, yeah, they're going to flee to Petra, they're going to go and be there, but that's the place that's deserted right now for all intents and purposes. And I heard one person say that every day there are a thousand Jews that visit that place. Every day of the year, a thousand Jews go and visit Petra. They're going to know exactly where it is. They're going to know how to get there. That's over 300,000 people that go every year just from the Jewish folks. That doesn't include all of us who might go and visit the land and go and, and see the place. Israel will know how to get to its place of protection. God will guide them. I don't have any problem with how he's going to get them there even. You want to know how he's going to get them there? I, I don't know. It doesn't tell us. It just tells us they're going to flee to this place of protection that's made for them. But you can use your imagination. He's done this before. He's led them through the wilderness before. A pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. It would not surprise me to have the glory of God appear before His nation, before His people, and lead them in the same way back to their safety. We know He's going to provide for their safety. The serpent won't be able to get in there. That He will nourish them. He's going to be their provision. They won't have need to take clothes with them. They won't have need to do any of that and gather things and, and run in a great organized caravan. Because God himself is going to care for them. He'll protect them. They're going to realize. They're going to experience that, na that nation as a whole again will experience the protection of Messiah, of their God, of Jehovah. They're going to know just like Israel knew before in the past. And there'll be no doubt in their mind. Verse 15, So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away in the flood, or by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Now is this going to be a literal flood? Or is this going to be an army that tries to come in? You know in Jeremiah that Egypt is called a flood, that the armies of Egypt are going to come and that they're referred to as a flood and that they're going to be wiped out. And that another army will come like a flood against Israel. God will protect them there too. So it could be that. It could be the armies that there are armies that come to try to attack in their safe place. And that the, the earth itself will open up and swallow up these armies. Could happen. Maybe somehow the Antichrist figures out a way to send a literal flood to try to 
imitate the great flood that God used to cleanse the earth back in Noah's time. And that that would maybe be his show, a, a, a false sign, to use a literal flood. And yet God still, it, it doesn't matter to me if it's a literal flood or if it's a flood of men that are trying to take out the nation of Israel. God will protect them. The earth will help. The earth will open up and swallow up whatever's coming against them. Verse 17 says, then, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So he can't touch Israel. So he's going to turn and he's going to try to track down anyone else who will identify with, with Jesus Christ. Anybody who won't identify with him. And we're still talking about Satan here, but we're going to see here in a little bit that Satan possesses the Antichrist. That he sets him up. He's allowed to set him up. In fact, let's look at that. Verse 13, or chapter 13 now. It says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw the beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his, head, on his horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. So we saw that similar description of the dragon. Now we see it as a description of, of the Antichrist. It says, And the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. And so they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So John stands on the, it says, On the sand of the sea, and I saw the great beast rising out of the sea. The sea representing the nations of the time. So this person is going to come on the scene in a time of great disarray we have the attack from the north toward israel that god will defend this is going again back to the beginning of the of the tribulation time we'll have the attack from the north we'll have the rapture of the church i mean what else can we have the the attack from the north when god defends that that'll break the the strength of the former soviet union of, of russia that will break the strength of Islam. Because most of the nations that gather at that time for the attack of the north, Ezekiel uh, 38, 37, 38, uh, most of those nations are Islamic nations. And we see them now, in our time, forming against us. And the, and the lines are being drawn. You know, the Bible tells us that Saudi Arabia won't be for this attack. And just in the last couple of weeks, I've heard Saudi Arabia speaking against some of these other nations. The lines are already being drawn. They're already moving into their positions. And they can't help themselves. They can't stop. Now, outside of God pulling back things, this is, this is moving ahead. A couple of weeks ago, I told you guys to look at this. Don't, we can't be lazy and say, just look at the signs and we're going to sit here and watch the signs and wonders. That's the finish line. We're supposed to run toward that. And if you're looking at things like that and you're going, man, the end is soon, the end is soon. Don't just sit and, and wait for the end to come. It means the end of our time is soon. Finish well. The crowns and the horns speak of world powers, of authority, of, of governments. This one person will be able to organize He'll be able to bring them all into a, a group or a kind of a coalition. And if you read in the Old Testament, read the prophecies of the time in the Old Testament, this isn't exactly a peaceful time. It's not like he brings a real true peace to the earth. There's still a lot of contentions between these, these folks in these countries. 
but he's just going to like come out of nowhere. And, and you look at that and go, well, how can that happen? You know, even, even some believers who think that we won't be raptured before the tribulation, think it'll be in the middle or after, and so they're looking, they're looking for the identity of this man like it's already known. But listen, we have a president that six years ago, who knew who he was? You know, I, all I knew of this guy was that he had made a speech at the Democratic Convention eight years ago for John Kerry. That's all, that, that was the first mention I ever heard of the man. He came on the scene out of nowhere and won over a whole nation. This person will come on the scene and win over a whole world that's in chaos. And it won't be that hard for him. And listen, I'm not even going to give him all the credit. It's not going to be that hard for him because God has set it up. He's given man over to the depravity of their own hearts and minds. And so the chaos that we see now, the violence that we see now, that's just the beginning of it. When the restraining force is taken out, when the church is taken out, how much more freedom are they going to have to carry on in the way that they do? It'll all be increasing with Satan being restricted to the earth and in his fury being able to turn on even the, the other believers. He won't be able to touch Israel, but be able to turn on the other believers and make war with them, those who have given their heart to the Lord during tribulation time. The animals speak of his power. I mean, those are some powerful animals. A bear is a powerful animal. A leopard is an extremely powerful cat. He may not be physically the biggest cat, but pound for pound, he's one of the most powerful cats. I think the only one that, and and maybe it's more like a jaguar, but from what I understand, a jaguar is pound for pound the most powerful cat. And he's about the same size as a leopard. So in other words, if a jaguar was as big as a lion, he'd be way more powerful than a lion. And I think a leopard is, is very similar to that. They're built very similar animals, even though they're on different continents from one another. The mouth like a lion, he'll have authority. It says the dragon gave him his power, his throne, his authority. It said, and I saw one of the heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. Some think that right after he, he kills the two witnesses, that somebody will take a shot at him. So he'll kill the two witnesses, he'll defile the temple, and somebody will raise up and wound him. And it'll be a mortal wound, and that he'll raise himself up, or the, Satan will be able to raise him up. See, he's not anti-Christ like he's against Christ. It's anti means instead of. He's setting himself up to be the Messiah, to look like the Messiah. Satan really doesn't have an original thought here. Everything is imitation of God. Everything. To the point that he tries to convince us that we can be like God. There's a pretty popular teaching going around right now that I didn't realize how popular it was. But basically it teaches you, you you can set up your own reality. That everything around you is your own reality. You guys are just here because I've put you here. All the violence and everything in my, in my life is because yeah, it's bad vibes coming from me. That's ridiculous. That makes me God. That I can change that by being more po positive. You guys are all just a figment of my reality that I've created. That's insane. That is anti-God. 
That's the same lie he told Eve. God's not telling you the whole deal because he, wants you, he, he doesn't want you to be him. He doesn't want you to be like him. It's the same thing. There's nothing new with him. It's just repackaged. That's, that's new age through and through. But it's Satan's false religion. And so he's going to have Satan, representative of the Father. He's going to have Antichrist, representative of Jesus. And he's going to have the false prophet that we'll probably look at next week. Representative of the Holy Spirit. Doing all kinds of lying wonders. All kinds of things that point to the Antichrist and tell you to worship him. Right down to this man dying for a time and coming back. And look what it says. So they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast and they worship the beast saying who is like the beast who is able to make war with him. You see there it doesn't say they thought they were worshiping God. But they were mistaken or they were misled. They're going to know who they worship. They're going to worship the dragon. This is going to be out and out satanic worship. So with all these commentaries and stuff that talk about, oh, he's setting up his own, they kind of, some of them miss this. They're going to worship the dragon. They're going to worship Satan and the Antichrist. They're going to buy it. Who can be like him? Listen, after three and a half years of this man being on the scene and as a, a world-dominating political figure who can't stop any of the judgments of God, they know the judgments are coming from God, we've already seen them, that they're going to testify of that themselves. And we'll see in a little while when more judgment begins to pour out, they're going to gnash their teeth and they're going to blaspheme the God of heaven. They're going to chew off their tongues because of the pain. And yet they'll have enough left to blaspheme the God of heaven. So all their, all their wickedness, all their blasphemy, all their lack of respect, I don't know how you put it, just the, all the wickedness of man's heart is going to be directed at the God of heaven. So the, the, the two sides are not going to be blurred anymore. You're going to have Jesus who they're going to know, somehow they're going to know. I don't know if it's because they find Bibles or just because of the, the testimony of the two witnesses. They're going to know who they're at war against. And now they have a leader. And now he's come back from the dead. Now he set himself up in the temple. He killed the two witnesses, but they're gone. He can't stop that. He can't stop any of the judgment. He can't stop any of the wrath of God. And yet they're going to say, who can be at war? Who can make war with the beast? Who can, who can stand against him? Really? But we also know that God's going to give people over to their depraved minds. He's going to let them worship what they want to worship. Some people will ask us, well, why didn't he stop this? Why didn't he stop suffering now? Why didn't he, why didn't he just not let any of this happen and just take us all to heaven? Why, why has he got to go through all this? Well, first of all, he issued a warning to Adam. If you eat from that tree, you're going to die. And that'll be the inheritance you send to everybody else after you. Rebellion. A rebellious, sinful nature. He let Adam exercise his free will. See, that's what people want. They want to be able to exercise their will, but they still want the benefits of following God and go to heaven. And they're going to be bent when they don't get that. You don't get to just exercise your free will without the consequences that come with that. And there's warning against that. People will say, how does a loving God let this happen? It doesn't have to happen like that for you. He's provided a way for you to know Him. That's His Word. He's provided a way for you to have a relationship with Him. 
He's redeemed you if you'll accept it on the cross. He was the sacrifice. He paid the price. You don't have to not be in heaven with him. And guess what? Doing that, you're exercising your free will. You choose. You choose to follow him or you choose to reject him. And you see where it leads, both directions. He's very clear. You follow me, you accept me, you love me, you will be with me always. If you reject me, if you reject what I've done for you, then I don't know you. And you won't have any part of me. A loving God sent his son to die for you. Well, I don't understand why people don't like that. You know why they don't like it? Because it holds them accountable. That they can't save themselves. That there's somebody to answer to. So they worshiped the drag or yeah, they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for forty two months, so the other three and a half years of this time. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose, name, whose, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain before the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads... Into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills but with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here's the patience and faith of the saints. Two things happen. Again, the lines are drawn. The patience of the saints. Patience of the saints. They're willing. We just read to, they don't love their, their life. They don't even, they don't care. They're not about protecting themselves. They're about living out and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus even in this time. And the other side, blasphemy. They aren't worried about Buddha anymore. They aren't worried about Muhammad anymore. It is Satan and it is Jesus. And the saints that are left, it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Well, there's the word saints, Glenn. Are you sure the church isn't still here? Listen, the Old Testament, nine books call the believers of the Old Testament time saints. This is a reference again back to Israel, back to those who believe. It's in the church. Look, there's a, there's, when we read the, the letters to the churches, they ended with, let him who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here it just says, let him who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. Or if anyone has an ear, let him hear. Just anyone has an ear, let him hear. It doesn't say what the Spirit says to the churches. That time is done. It says, all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose name, names have not been written in the Lamb's, or his names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain before the foundation of the earth, or before the foundation of the world. So there's the other great debate about this section. Is it talking about the book written before the foundation of the world, or is it talking about the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world? Is it the book of the Lamb, or the book of life, or the Lamb? It's 
Both. The book of life written before the foundation of the world. The Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. Well, okay. I can understand that God set salvation plan in motion even before He created the heavens and the earth. I'll buy that. That's great. Right? Jesus made a way before because He already knew Adam was going to fall. But really, your name was written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the earth? That doesn't seem very fair. The decision was made before. Who was going to get into heaven? Who wasn't? First of all, just remember, I didn't write this. But look at Ephesians chapter 1. So here goes Glenn on predestination again. Let's start with verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. By the way, I love to hear you turn in the pages. If I ever get convinced to start using this technology stuff and putting things up on the screen, don't quit bringing your Bibles, because if I quit hearing pages turn, we'll shut it back off. You need to have this in your hand. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed is be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will and to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. So you mean God set this all in order? He just said, all right, I'm going to create Glenn. He's going to make it. I'm going to create this other guy. I'm not going to let him in. What happened to free will? You were already talking just a few minutes ago about free will and exercising our free will and our choice. Isn't this our choice? Listen, from God's perspective, is he all-knowing or not? Is he omniscient? Is he just all-knowing now? It wasn't before he created everything. Romans chapter 8 tells us, those who he foreknew, he predestined. He knew before He created you the decision you would make. He's going to let you make the decision. So from our perspective, from here on earth, from our life where we're at, our will is still in play. We make the decision. You sit where God's sitting, you see it all. He knows all. Listen, if you're a believer, take comfort in the fact that it was set in stone as though it had already happened before you were ever even born. Before your grandparents were born. Before Adam and Eve. He had you securely in his hand already. It's a God who, who can't lose. He already knew. I oh, really glad no still create us with a free will. That's not fair. How do you listen? Get saved. If you're not saved, get saved. Then you're part of this already. You don't have any conflict, do you? And you're part of the, the ones who knew or who were known, who were written. If you don't, you reject them. Well, you're not in the Lamb's Book of Life, and I'm sorry. That's just, you know. But that's not fair. Well, what is fair? Doing it your way? That's what's fair. What you think is the right way, you're doing it your way. Guess what? It's not God's way. So you're on the wrong side. I don't want to be on the wrong side. Then just be, give up and give your life to Him. And guess what? You'll find out. You were lit, written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the earth. But, no, no more buts, no more excuses. 
we see what's going to happen to those who only want their way. They're going to come into bondage of Satan, complete and total. They'll reach a point where they're going to take a mark showing the allegiance to this man, worshiping the dragon. When they take that mark, man, it is set, it is done. There's no more second chance after that. I don't care if you live through the rest of the tribulation time. When they take that mark, there is no more second chance. The sides are very clear. Aren't we seeing that as we go through this? We're seeing everything stripped back. You're either for me or you're against me, Jesus said. You worship me or you worship Satan. I don't care what reality you thought, try to choose to live in. The reality is right here. And whatever delusion you have for whatever religion you want to follow right now, if tomorrow I'm gone and the tribulation time starts, and all the believers are gone, not just me, I know I'm not the only one going, so let's not, oh no, no, Glenn's talking about like he's, I'm not the one. That's why you say today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to make your choice. You don't wait anymore. You don't take the chance. Well, when I see the rapture, then I'll know and then I'll, I'll make my choice. No, you won't. No, you won't. We already looked at verses in, in I think, 2 Thessalonians that say no. No, if you reject Jesus now and the rapture happens and the tribulation starts, you already knew you don't get it, you're done. You don't want to be a part of that. Today's the day to be saved. Today's the day. And not only that, you're not even guaranteed. We, when we go through this, we run into the danger of, of everything in our life revolves around the moment of the rapture. You're not guaranteed to make it to that. Well, what happens if you walk outside here and somebody bumps you and you fall into the loading dock and break your neck? You're not waiting for the rapture anymore, are you? You're not waiting for another sign. That's it. Right there, face to face with Jesus. And you're either hearing, well done, good and faithful servant, enter in, or you're hearing, I don't know who you are. You don't have any part of me. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. The sword they'll be killed with is going to be the sword that comes from the mouth of, of Jesus. When we see him come in all of his glory. When his word comes out of his mouth like a two-edged sword and takes out all who are gathered in the valley of Armageddon to do war against him. And he told Peter, you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. If you live and think that you're going to live under the power of man and make it to heaven, it ain't going to happen. But here is the patience of the saints, the patience and faith of the saints. Patience and faith of the saints. Your faith. Patience waiting through all of this to finally be with Him. Your faith and your patience constantly being built up. Constantly being built up. People tell you all the time, man, don't pray for patience because that means what? To, for patience to develop? Trial. Hard times. Don't pray for that. You're crazy if you pray for patience. You're asking God to, to put you through trials. Listen, if you need more patience, 
Guess what you're going to go through? It ain't going to matter if, you, if you're a believer and God wants to develop your patience. You're going through some trials. You're going to go through a time of waiting, maybe. Maybe it's just waiting to hear from God. Maybe it doesn't have to be, you know, stripped down to nothing, losing everything you have, health and well. You don't have to be Job. It's just waiting for an answer, waiting for God to move you. I mean, we, we just started this almost three years ago with a Bible study in June. It'll be three years. I came back to Michigan to start a church in 1995. I spent six years in Greenville. I spent eight and a half years in Kalamazoo being an assistant pastor. And some of the guys that, that I know, even pastors were like, what are you doing that for? Why would you go do that? You know, you're know, you supposed to be a senior pastor. Don't you have any faith in the calling that God's put on your life? Yeah, I do. I have all the faith of it. And I'm going to sit here and I'm going to be patient. I'm going to be where he's putting me, where he's calling me to be for the moment. Oh, yeah, but didn't you think you believed with all your heart that he called you to Greenville, didn't you? Yeah, I did. You know what happened in Greenville? I picked up two boys. It wasn't what I thought it was going to be. No, I was there. I got to act as a pastor for a few individuals. I got to, to, to counsel people, to teach the Word of God, but it wasn't a church like we have now. So what? I got to go and fill in for other guys. God was developing me and getting me ready for now. You know, the patience. Y'all, listen, once you've been doing this and you're, and you're teaching verse by verse through the Bible, do you know how hard it is to be patient when you're the guy that's waiting to fill in? Because when you finally do, and, and somebody says, hey, I need you to fill in. Roger, call me. Oh, I'm sick. I need you to fill in. Okay. What am I going to teach? Yeah, I hunt and peck. I'm going to try to find something. Lord, you got to help me out. you got to bail me out. It's horrible to have to do that. I had to do that for Josh a couple of weeks ago on Thursday night. Hey, I'm not going to be here Thursday night. I need you to fill in. Okay. Oh, I'm back here again. At least now I know where I'm going next week. Next week we'll be in chapter 13, start with verse 11, if you want to read ahead. Listen, patience. Patience is a mark of being a believer. Your faith, mark of being a believer. Their impatience and their rage and their faith in the dragon is a mark of being a non-believer. Or at least a believer on the wrong side. He loved you enough to put you in the grandstands for all of this. If you believe in Him now, if you give Him your life, you accept, you accept the sacrifice that He made. You understand that you have to have that sacrifice to avoid being separated from Him for all of eternity. You don't cease to exist in eternity even if you don't believe in Jesus. You follow Satan, you follow the beast, you follow Hades, you follow it all. The false prophet right into the lake of fire for an eternal torment. And it's not like Satan's going to be there with a pitchfork prodding you and torturing you and tormenting you. He's going to be in his own. Part of that torment will be hearing the weeping and the wailing and the gnashing of teeth of all those around you, but it's going to be part of you too. You're going to be part of their torment. No end. No end to it. No way out. Nobody's going to be able to pray you out. Nobody's going to be able to give enough money to the church to get you out. Nobody's going to make the right sacrifice for you. One already did. You take it or you reject it. When he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father except through me, he meant exactly that. Not I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one in Israel comes to the Father but by me. Or, you know, over here we have another way. 
I am the way, excluding all other ways. I am the truth, excluding all other truths. I am the life. And nobody, nobody, nobody comes to the Father except coming through me. That's pretty exclusive. It, it becomes exclusive. It, it, well, it is. It is exclusive. You have to believe in Jesus. But it's open to everybody. And we're not going to go back to the predestination thing. You already, we went around the circle with that already. If you don't know Jesus, give your life to him. The Holy Spirit will show you what I'm talking about. He'll explain it to you. Let's pray. And as we get ready to pray, if you have never, ever accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is the day. Don't wait anymore. And listen, maybe, maybe you haven't been Maybe you are a believer. Maybe you've just been compromised. Maybe you've just not been living the way you're supposed to, exercising that free will in ways that you shouldn't have been. It's time to get your identification right, isn't it? Listen, if you've never given your life to the Lord before and you want to today, I want you to raise your hand. You never asked Jesus. You never asked for forgiveness. You never asked Him to help you walk in a new life. You've never done that, but you want to today. Raise your hand. If you've never been walking or you haven't been walking as a true believer, as a son of God, If you haven't been living like a child of God, if you haven't been feeling the patience and the faith, you haven't been working with that, you have God, you just need to hear. You have sin in your life you need to repent of? Raise your hand. Lord Jesus. Lord, we love you and we thank you for all that you've done for us. Lord, thank you for paying the price on the cross. Lord, thank you. Thank you for making our relationship secure with you even before we knew about it. Lord, I praise you that you are an all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present God. Lord, thank you that there's no place to hide from you. And Lord, thank you for opening our eyes, my eyes, to still see your love, even in a passage that talks about judgment. Lord, thank you for the assurance of your word that the enemy will not prevail. He will not win. He cannot win. And Lord, right now we will pray for all those that we know who are lost. All those who reject you. Lord, please speak to their hearts. Lord, I pray that we would have the opportunity to see new lives, people being transformed by your power, understanding and receiving your forgiveness. Lord, thank you for making the provision for us to not be here, not go through all of this that you have not reserved your church for wrath. Lord, we look forward to the day when we hear the shout from heaven, the voice like an archangel, the voice of a trumpet, calling us up. 
Lord, we look forward to the day of seeing the dead in Christ rise. We look forward to coming into the throne room of heaven and worshiping you for all of eternity. To fully understanding, having complete access to you. Most of all, Lord, just for making the way, we thank you so much again for making the way for us to be with you for all of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen.